Hola, somos Tania Moreno y Daniela Álvarez de TCU. Y estás escuchando College Volleyball Weekly. ¡Go, Go Frogs! This is Tania Moreno and Daniela Álvarez from TCU. And you're in College Beach Volleyball Weekly. ¡Go, Go Frogs! Hi everyone, I'm Charlie Ekstrom of Stanford Beach Volleyball and you are listening to College Volleyball Weekly Beach Edition. Hi, I'm Alana Rennie of Arizona Beach Volleyball. And I'm Alex Parker of Arizona Beach Volleyball and you're listening to College Beach Volleyball Weekly. Is that right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, welcome to another edition of College Volleyball Weekly, Beach Edition Top 20, and I'm excited to have here on today, not only Mads Fitzpatrick back on the podcast and the vodcast, but we get to have Cal Poly representatives, uh, Tia Mirich, a 5'8", redshirt senior from Thornhill, Ontario, Canada, was first team All-Big West Conference in 2021, and if you don't know who else is on here, I'm going to help you out here. Three-time Olympian, Beijing Olympics gold medalist, International Volleyball Hall of Fame inductee in 2021. Congratulations, by the way, Todd. Uh, AVPA, AVP champion, AVCA indoor All-American in those tight shorts at UC Santa Barbara, because I remember those. And then uh, I got to be the uh, first host of the AVP Wall of Champions in 2016, in which, Todd, you were the first one that was uh, inducted into that uh, particular uh, awards. So uh, great having you all on. Thank Thanks for having, for having us. All right. First question for you, Todd, is this. Uh, you're going into your seventh season as head coach of a fairly new program and have already played in two NCAA championship tournaments at Gulf Shores. Uh, you've amassed a 106 and 67 records since taking over the beach program and have been named Big West Coach of the Year twice. How have you been so successful in guiding this program atop the Big West and a viable top 10 uh, beach team? I think it has to start with the players. Uh, I was very fortunate uh, that, you know, within my career, I got to know a lot of different people and I reached out to them and said, Hey, I'm going to be a college coach. This is the college I'll be at Cal Poly. Uh, and one of those people actually was uh, Tia's former coach, John Childs, who you probably remember as a bronze medalist from Canada in the 96 Olympics uh, and said, Hey, do you got any players that would be interested in coming down here? And lo and behold, Tia ended up being one of those first players, um, was very fortunate in that uh, the Van Winden sisters, Adley and Tori, uh, both uh, eventually matriculated over to Cal Poly. So really it started with getting some players in, uh, raising the level, uh, giving them you know, all, or trying to give them as much knowledge as I could of the game. When I first started, it was almost all indoor gals. In fact, it was pretty much all indoor gals that a few of them had a little bit of beach experience, but not a lot. Uh, so getting them up to speed and then adding in a few recruits here and there. And you know, part of it's probably a little bit of luck and a little bit of skill, but really bringing in those top players just changed the program. Uh, and then all of a sudden more top players wanted to come. And you know, two years in, we're a top 10 program. And now we're, we're vying with the, the FSUs and the UCLA's, et cetera, of the world. Yep. Well, this question's for you, Tia, but under Todd's tutelage, you've uh, amassed quite a few Big West Conference uh, awards, ABC All-American, academic honors. What do you think of the honors you've been recognized for, and um, you know, how did you come about to become so successful? Yeah, I mean, coming into Cal Poly and coming into the NCAA, uh, I'm from Canada, obviously, so I had no idea what to expect. I didn't really know like what the caliber was, where I would fit um, in the NCAA as a whole and in, at Cal Poly. So coming in, I definitely wasn't expecting any of it. Um, but, but I guess in the first couple months and years, I started seeing a bit of success for myself. Um, and I just, I guess I'm just the kind of player that puts my head down and works hard and um, in the end, when the when the awards started coming through, it was obviously a really pleasant surprise. Um, but I obviously couldn't have done it without Todd. <laughs> He's definitely <laughs> the best coach I've ever had, and has definitely made me what I am today. So, yeah, it's been a really really pleasant surprise, and it's always made me really hungry for more. Well, I've got to ask you this. I know this we didn't talk about this beforehand, but how would you describe coaches coaching style and I have an idea 
but I don't want to put you on the spot. You like lose your spot on the court in the upcoming weekends. But um, I think pe- the common person wants to know what, uh, how a coach could be described. So um, number one, best, best coach ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, assured starting spot this weekend. There you go. I'll keep you in the spots here. Good job. <laughs> uh, no, but for real, he's, um, he's super, he's very relaxed and chill, I would say, but at the same time knows when he, when to, you know, kind of press on the gas pedal and be tough on us. Um, he's obviously like the smartest, one of the smartest players of all time. So um, he's taught me a lot of physical things, but I think more than anything, Todd teaches, he likes to stay like from the shoulders up um, because beach volleyball is a super mental game. And uh, I think Todd does a really, really good job of um, coaching us mentally um, first and then physically. I mean, his workouts are extremely tough too, (laughs) but the, the mental part is definitely the most important. And I think um, it's part of what's made me um, the player that I am and a lot of other girls um, on the team. But yeah, really, really nice, relaxed coach too. <laughs> well, one of the times I'd seen you, Todd, and it was one of the things that really it, it caught my eye as far as your coaching style, but it's at one of the USAV Collegiate Beach Championships. I was watching you work with a team that you had going into the finals that particular year, but it was just amazing to see the um, the mentor that you were on the court, like the way that you're teaching them and also very involved in the training and the drills to get your, your players warmed up. But it is like a, a wonderful nurturing type of relationship with the two players because you can see they were just eating it all up. Is that an adequate assessment of, of where you say Tia or Todd? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I like to think of kind of like you, you know, that on the head to nurture, uh, to try and get the best out of them, uh, whether that's as Tia said, kind of being relaxed and, and chill or being able to put my foot down, um, so to speak. In a lot of ways, you know, I've got a 23-year-old daughter now and a 20-year-old son. And, you know, in, in a lot of ways, the, the team and the gals are, are kind of like daughters. They're not actually, you know, my daughters, um, but th- I treat them similarly and want to do or guide them in the best way, whether that's on the court or off the court. And I, I kind of just feel like that's what a good coach will do their best to do. And when we're on the court, it's about that. And there might even be a few life lessons on that front as well. <laughs> well, I had, I will have to recognize, I saw on your team's Instagram feed that they were mocking the way that you dressed. Um, the whole team dressed up in your, your visor and glasses and walked to practice that one day, I do believe, right? Yeah, yeah that was pretty good. Uh, they were definitely punking me, uh, but that's, <laughs> Like, I, I think that's awesome. Uh, I thought it was hilarious. Uh, it was a great idea. Uh, a lot of them even had the, the painted on goatees and stuff like that. And they practice that way. And uh, I, I think that for me, that's a compliment. Um, and I, I, I like to think that's a real culture thing too, that they, they're comfortable making fun of me in that, uh, that way. And, and we all laugh about it still. Uh, and that's, that's a good thing. That's what I want uh, in any team that I'm involved in. Yep. Well, I'm hoping to see you go next level and get a TikTok account, but uh, we'll, we'll <laughs> see from there. <laughs> and Mads, go ahead and step on in. Uh, when Tori came over to Florida State, we asked her, like, what was your favorite part about Cal Poly and stuff? And she said you 100% taught. She, like, ranted and raved about you probably for, like, 15 minutes. I was like, dang, he sounds incredible. But, yeah, I've heard awesome things, like exactly what Tia just said. Um, okay, so this is for either of you. Um, the Mustangs finished 24 and 11 during the 2021 season with big wins over number six, Stanford, Pepperdine, Cal, and Hawaii. Looking back, what are your guys' thoughts on that regular season? Yeah. Um, last season, I think we had uh, a really strong season. Obviously, we made it the furthest we have um, in the NCAA tournament, and I think finished um, the highest strength that we have before. Um, I thought it was a pretty, a pretty steady season. And I think we just got, we had low points, but we just got better and better. Um, especially in the last few weeks of season, I feel like the whole season, we did a really good job of preparing for those last couple of weeks. Come out super strong in the big West tournament. Um, and then obviously, uh, having a pretty good run, um, at the NCAA tournament, um, and I think we finished strong and each year for the last couple of years, we've been doing better and better. 
And I think last season really set us up well to do our even better this year, which is really exciting. Todd? Yeah, I would agree uh, with Tia's assessment. Uh, we had a few gals that were a little banged up in the beginning of the season. And as they got physically better, uh, and then we're able to be, you know, in the lineup and kind of just continue to get their sand legs, if you will. Uh, it, we just kept getting better and better and the mentality was getting better and better and kind of not only came to a culmination at NCAAs, but really the Big West when we lost to Hawaii, they upset us and we played them, gosh, what was it, seven times last year to year or something ridiculous. Um, yeah, it was pretty nuts. With COVID and whatnot, we went over there, played three duels. We, we kind of worked well together. But we lost to them and had to come through a double elimination uh, bracket and, and beat them twice more in the finals to actually take the title and uh, kind of prove to them, hey, you know, you physically work really hard with a plyometric workout and a track workout and all the things we do. Uh, and this is why, because you're able to play a ton of games in essentially four or five hours uh, nonstop and still be able to take the title at the end. Madison, you might know a little bit of that. You know, Brooke and I were... Uh, many times on the track together, many times on the beach together, doing those kinds of workouts. And I'm pretty sure you guys do some similar stuff as well. Oh yeah. She's tough. And she does it all with us. Like she's <laughs> running just as fast as all of us. Like, how do you do this? She's incredible. So <laughs> odds right out there with us too. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Those are the best coaches for yeah. sure. Totally. Yeah, it's when you don't see them icing down at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else we can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question is just for either of you. And um, based upon last year's performance, the Mustangs were heavily favorites with over a 63 percentage win percentage in the one, two, and three pairs. What made those pairs so tough to beat for you guys? And we'll start with you, Todd. I think uh, first and foremost, age. Uh, we were pretty uh, heavily laden with older gals at that level. We had uh, two seniors or two fourth year, actually a fourth year and a fifth year at our ones pair, Emily Sunny in her fifth year and Macy Gordon in her fourth. Uh, our twos pairs was Jalen Lombard, who was a junior, and Amy Ozzy, who was a fifth year. And then our third was Tia, um, who it was in her fourth year, and Mariah, who was also in her fourth year. So you know, we had age, we had experience, uh, they were battle tested. Uh, so I, I think that was definitely the, the main core reason is experience. Uh, and obviously they were physically gifted athletes, can't compete without that having that. Uh, but they definitely had the up here aspect pretty nailed down. And uh, as Mariah got better and healthier, she and Tia really came on strong at the end of the year and kind of solidified our one, two, threes across the board uh, pretty nicely. Yep. Tia, what do you, anything to add on to that? I think he said, said it, said it all. <laughs> I think you're saying, yeah, I, I killed it at the threes and I, I should be in the starting three, no matter what. Right. All right, Mads, yeah, jump on in. Yeah. That kind of segues us perfectly. Um, Tia, what do you feel like, or what made you and Mariah such a successful pair at the threes? Yeah. Well, we had, We'd played together the year prior, um, I guess like the COVID year, 2019, 2020 season. Mm -hmm. So we had a little bit of experience playing together, which was really nice. And um, before the season got canceled, her and I were getting into really a really good groove. Um, so that kind of put us in a good position for the, the next season. Um, and I think Mariah and I are alike in a lot of ways. I think we have a similar work ethic and mentality about the game. Um, so it made it easy to connect on those things. Um, and when we stepped on, we were, we're really good friends off the court. I think she's an amazing person, um, which always helps. But when we stepped on the court, it was always almost like business, which I think is really important in beach volleyball. Um, so I think we did a really good job of taking care of business when we were on the court. Maybe not in earlier in the season, last season, but generally when we play, when we play together, um, I think we're really on the same page. We're not afraid to um, communicate openly and, and tell each other what we need from each other. Um, or if one of us needs to pick it up, we're not afraid. Well, I'm gonna direct this next question just uh, towards um, uh, Todd here. But um, I know you'd already named some of your top performers, but if you're to, 
identify some newer names on that list because I remember meeting a bunch of uh, players in the 2019, 2018 juniors tour in the summer. And you know, whenever I'd ask them, so where are you heading? They're going to Cal Poly, like Josie Ulrich, Piper Ness, um, so many uh, people. And then I met Mariah Whalen. I guess she's training in Hermosa Beach. She's like, yeah, I'm going to Cal Poly. But um, who do you see as some of the top performers now and who could be stepping up here in the near future? We have some uh, some young gals that that hopefully will step up. Uh, certainly, the ones you named, uh, Josie, and she's been pretty ensconced in our, our lineup um, towards the back end the last couple of years. Obviously, her first year was the COVID year, which was a, a bummer for her. But last year, she anchored our five spot, um, and hopefully, she'll continue to move forward. Uh, we have a uh, Piper Ness, of course, Sam Straw. Uh, they were Sam was in the fours last year, mostly for us, and um, Piper was kind of in that sixes and fives. Um, she's kind of found a groove, although got, got banged in the head this last week. Uh, so should be good to go by tomorrow, but one of those concussion kind of things. And then we have some freshmen that have come in that, um, that are very talented. And uh, they're so, some bigs, some defenders. And so I think Ella Connor, Piper Furge, Peyton Duick, um, they, they're going to be relied on within our squad. And see how they how they do and how they perform and hopefully they can raise the bar even higher than their predecessors like Tia and Macy Gordon and Emily Sunny. Hi everyone this is Madison Fitzpatrick at Florida State and you're listening or watching College Volleyball Weekly Beach Edition Top 20. Hi I'm Erica Brock from FAU. Hi Mackenzie Morris from FAU. And you're listening to College Volleyball Weekly Beach Edition. Um, we can go Tia then Todd. Uh, was there any particular duel that was a highlight of your 2021 season last season? Any duel that stands out? I'd have to say I have two of them. Um, the first one would be that second, the second game against Hawaii Todd was talking about when we had to play them back to back for the um, Big West Championship. Um, that was super fun. Uh, we had played that team already twice on the same day or in the same weekend or something like that. Um, and we were pl now playing them a third time. Um, and it, it was evident that we were, I think, physically more ready for that game, um, just given our um, fitness background as, with Todd as our coach. Um, and it was just really awesome to step on that court and start it and just like, no, we had it in the bag. It just felt like it flowed so well. Um, we had lots of energy. Um, and it was really cool to help us, uh, to help the team win that Big West Championship. Um, and then the second one would definitely be our duel uh, or our game against Stanford at the NCAA Championships, just because we had lost to Stanford earlier in the season. Um, and Mariah and I had lost in the three spot as well. So to come back uh, and play again at the threes at the NCAA Championship and win that game felt really good. Yeah, my, uh, my number one was actually a loss. Um, and it was at, when we lost to Hawaii at the Big West. Uh, it was in the winner's bracket. It was, what, Saturday morning, first match of the day, I think, or second match of the day, or duel of the day. Uh, we lost to them. And at the Big West, we play all the games out. So one, two, three, four, fives. We already knew we had lost. They had beaten us already 3-1. And Tia and Mariah were playing at the threes and finishing up. Uh, and actually, Tia and Mariah... Uh, one, they they won their game, so we lost quote unquote three two, and everyone was watching as Madison, you know, and Rob, you know, everyone's on the sidelines, kind of stuff cheering, and so you know we cheer the Kia and Mariah won, um, but we had lost the duel, so Hawaii's celebrating their their dual victory, and and the thing that actually spoke to me the most was Tia and Mariah walked up to the rest of the team, everyone huddled around them, and Tia just threw her hands up in the air, is like, well, I love this game, I'm ready for some more volleyball. Who wants to play more volleyball? Uh, and the whole team just started going ape. Excuse my friend, too sorry. Uh, ape crap. Um, and uh, and it was pretty. It was like almost like oh, okay, yeah, we're good. We're we're gonna go win this thing now. It's no problem. And oh, I remember how some of the people in Hawaii were looking over like, why are they going crazy over there? Like, what's the purpose? They just lost. And sure enough, I mean, we took care of our business the next couple, and we ended up winning uh, the Big West. So it was pretty. It was a cool pivotal moment, I think, and one of those moments where. Uh, kind of a, a fun comment, but you know, she did it kind of tongue in cheek, but it really struck a chord, I think with everyone on the team and, and really kind of pushed us 
over that that hump. Oh, that's such a cool story. Oh my gosh, I love that. <laughs> well, let, let's go back before the 2021 season started, but you know, obviously coming out of a, the shortened 2020 season because of the pandemic and um, what was your team's mindset going into the 2021 season? We know some use it as a huge inspiration to up their level of play, but I'm curious what that did for your team. And we'll start with you, Tia. Yeah. So when are you, so when we, when, you know, when COVID kind of started, um, we had an extremely stacked team and we were really excited about the year. Um, I think that we had a really good chance at a national championship that year. So we were all super bummed about the season, obviously, um, as COVID started rolling through, but I think, um, we just made sure to kind of stay on our toes, knowing things could always change at any moment. So just being open to, to change and, and being ready for whatever is going to come at us, I think. Um, and that helped us with the, with the next season going forward too. How about you, Todd? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll just echo what Tia said. Uh, it was a bummer that 20 season. Uh, that was when Tori uh, was on the team and Adley Van Winden. Uh, and they, obviously, Tori went and got a master's at FSU and Adley graduated. Uh, it just, uh, that was a bummer. But I think in 21, it was like, look, you guys, we're blessed to be able to play. Uh, so, because we just got canceled. So that was kind of the mindset. Like, let's be stoked every day just to be out here. We could get canceled at any point in time again. Uh, and it kind of just became kind of the theme. Let's just keep one day at a time moving forward. Be happy to actually be out here uh, because I just still remember that March 12th, I was literally sitting in a meeting of all head coaches, assistant coach, like every staff member uh, at Cal Poly. And it was the gal, I had to leave practice for that meeting and they were right outside the gym and we had it in the gym. And I remember the AD saying, we're done. And I raised my hand and said, you want me to tell all those gals that we're done? And he looked at me and he was really kind of pissed. Like, really, you're asking me this? But he's like, yeah, I'm sorry, but yeah, you got to. And I'm like, ouch. And so I had to walk out there and say, hey, you guys, season's done. And and it was not a fun, fun event. So just having that next season was really a, hey, let's just enjoy every minute of it because we don't know when it's going to get taken away from us. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> let's look at um, your Gulf Shores appearances. You know, your first one was in uh, 2019, and then you skipped 2020 because of COVID, uh, and are back in there last year, 2021. So technically, back-to-back -back seasons. Um, considering the experiences that you've had, um, did you feel that 2019, 2021 were different, and was it beneficial to have that prior experience going into 2021? And I'll start with you, Tia. Yeah, def there's, I thought there was a huge difference between those uh, two, two tournaments, uh, the 2019 and the 2021, just because being a team at the tournament for the first time was almost like shocking in a sense. We like had no idea what to expect. There's all these cameras around. It's like a huge production and we were signing autographs and taking pictures and all of these things. And none of us had really had any experience with that before. Um, and so I think that we were kind of like, whoa, taken aback a little bit that first tournament. And unfortunately, I think a little bit of a happy to be there vibe instead of like a, you know, go and win a national championship vibe. So um, going in the last year, um, 2021, I think that we were a lot more hungry and ready for the actual volleyball part of it, having already had the experience um, of the whole production. Um, and so I think that's why we did a bit better uh, the second time around. I think we were a little bit more like zoomed in and focused on what we were there to do rather than everything else going on. Mm -hmm. How about you, Todd? Completely agree with you. We were, we were very bright eyed and Holy moly, we're, we're here in 19 and 21. It was more, okay, another duel. Let's go. Uh, it's business as usual. Uh, so that, that, that mindset was nice to have that, that mental change. It, but that's the reality of going from an underdog uh, to the dog. Uh, and not necessarily the single dog, but being on that upper part. And that's changing the, the mental thought processes that you have when you get to, to play a top team or go to the NCAA tournament. Yeah. All right, Mads, jump back in. All right, so now we're going to talk about like 
this summer and this fall. Um, Tia, can you go over what you've been doing in the off season, either fall or summer training, getting ready for spring? Yeah, I mean, starting with the summer, I generally in the last couple of years haven't done a ton of beach volleyball. Um, I would play pickup here and there with some friends just because I found it best for myself to have a bit of, bit of a mental break um, from volleyball since it's so full on from September all the way to May. Um, so I usually, you know, stay in shape, lift weights and, and keep up with my fitness over the summer. And then as soon as September hits, we're pretty full on with practice and things like that. We get into our track workouts, as Todd was talking about before, and our plyometric workouts. Um, and we're back to 20 hours a week training uh, in the fall off season. So the fall almost essentially feels like a real season sometimes because you know we're traveling for pre or we're traveling for preseason tournaments sometimes um, and things like that. So we had a we always have a pretty tough fall. Um, but it really prepares us for the season. That's for sure. Hey, did you go back to Canada during the summer? I did. Yeah. I had an internship back in Canada. So I was home. Uh, do you do any uh, competitions up there? Cause I know that obviously with COVID is a little more strict. It seemed like across the border. Yeah. I don't think there were any tournaments this past summer. It has been pretty strict up there. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't get to compete at all. But in past summers, I've been able to compete in a couple of tournaments, which has been pretty fun, but not the past summer at all. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Naz, I'm going to skip my question. Have you go to your next one? All right. So looking, oh, wait, no, we're not looking towards the future yet. Still in the fall. Um, this is for both of you. Todd, you can go first. Did anyone's performance catch your eye during the fall? Just maybe name a few players and try not to make anyone feel left out. <laughs> uh, from our team you mean yes um i mean the the gals that uh that i had named previously the younger gals mm -hmm. but really actually some of the gals that that really caught my eye that that uh, i personally think either either figured it out or even my my assistant coaches joe rich uh, who's new to the program and then amy ozy who's my volunteer assistant and obviously was a player for me last year uh really helped them in my opinion which was uh, delaney peranich uh, she's really been siding out at a, at a much better level than she ever had before. Um, Eleanor Johansson uh, has been, you know, uh, playing some really, really good volleyball and uh, over the course of that fall. And they're, they're older players that have been in, the, in and out of the lineup at different points in time. Eleanor was in the lineup for the most part all of last season and Delaney in and out as well. Uh, but their improvement uh, was a happy Kind of a, oh, nice it's it's starting to go and, and whereas you know when the freshman or sophomore you kind of expect that because they're getting used to the system uh, so you know I, I, again yeah ho hopefully no one's angry at me for that but uh i feel like that those two were more ones that were pleasant surprises you knew you had they had it in them but they hadn't yet clicked in and now it's clicking in more and more and kind of nice to see that all right i'll take the uh okay. the next one then um so Tia, and I'm going to ask this in an awkward way because I, I don't know what your plans are after this season. COVID's really messed me up as far as students' eligibility. So you're a redshirt senior. Do you have, you know, what are, how are you feeling about going into your, what, quote, your final season? And what are your plans after that final season if it's this year? It is definitely my final <laughs> season this year. <laughs> my seventh year of college. I think it's time to move on. <laughs> I think it's Failure like, to launch, right? Yeah, yeah. Five <laughs> years, I think, in the NCAA now, or this is my fifth year or fourth year. I can't even keep track anymore. <laughs> oh, fifth. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> um, but I I'm extremely excited about this season. I think I'm more ready than I've ever been for this season. You know, it's been really up and down. Um, you know, injuries, like mental health stuff and COVID and so many things have gone on and it feels like everything has just prepared me for this season. Um, and I'm so ready and hungry to, to compete and, and hopefully win this team a national championship on my way out. I would, I would really, that would just be the icing on the cake of an amazing college experience for me, but yeah, I'm feeling really good going into this season. Awesome. Mads, jump back in. 
All right, this is for both of you. Um, based on your knowledge of the teams right now, what teams do you expect to be battling for the top in the Big West? Uh, I mean, the, the usual suspects, uh, Long Beach State and Hawaii uh, and us. Uh, I think the level of the Big West of all seven teams has improved, uh, particularly uh, the, the quote unquote four, five, six, and seven. Uh, and I actually hope that. I, I do, I want the conference to be stronger. Uh, I want to see the level of play just in general continue to improve. And it's the same thing in terms of just across the country, having more teams be a, a part of the NCAA landscape is awesome. So generally speaking, though, I'd say it's those those three will be vying for it. We saw them all in the fall and they looked uh, they looked pretty strong. Is Tia frozen? Oh, no, oh. I think he just, he just covered it all. Yeah. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm going to ask the next question. And it's, um, I guess, so what teams will be competing at the highest levels in the nation in 2022 from what you can gather you've seen so far? And uh, we'll start with you, Tia. You don't have to say Florida State either, just because <laughs> Mads is on here. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's funny. No, I mean... <laughs> As Todd said, I think it's generally the usual sus suspects if we look at like the top five to eight teams, I guess. Um, we have like USC, UCLA, LSU, FSU, um, who are always super strong. Um, and then I think after that, those are usually um, pretty strong from my experience. And then after that, especially this year with all the grad transfers, um, that have been moving around because of COVID. I think that the next couple of spots could be pretty up for grabs, depending on uh, who steps up for those. I mean, like Cal Poly one, obviously. <laughs> 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 that go, that's a given <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> well, go, well, Todd, do you want to name anything, any specific teams beyond the usual suspects? <laughs> uh, I do think, uh, obviously, uh, LMU will be really good again. I think TCU is going to be strong again. Uh, they've got a couple of those Spaniards that are quite talented. Uh, Long Beach State looks uh, stronger than I have seen them in the last couple of years. Uh, so uh, I know they have injuries. We saw them in the fall. And the fall is never necessarily a, an exact uh, what you're going to get. Uh, but I was pretty impressed with the improvements from last year. Uh, so there's some, some teams right there that maybe aren't in the usual top four, um, but could easily break into that top four and make some waves. Yep. Yep. All right, Mads, go for it. I agree about TCU, and I'm excited because they're good this year. Well, they've been good in years past, too. I feel like they're going to be really good this year, and they're in our conference, so I'm excited to see them. Um, okay, so what are your guys' thoughts on the NCAA tournament expanding to 16 teams? You can go first, Tia. I, it doesn't really change much for me, to be honest. I'm glad that a lot more teams get to have the experience. Um, and I think it's great that the sport is growing. I mean, even since I've been been in the NCAA, I've seen the sport grow so much. Um, and I've been following the NCAA beach volleyball since it first became a sport. So um, to actually be a part of it and see and see the growth is really exciting. Um, but in terms of my mindset for the season, it doesn't change a whole lot. Todd, what do you think? I'm super excited to see it grow to 16. I was on the commit NCAA committee uh, 2018 to 2020, uh, and we fought for that. Like literally, it felt like every month we were sending emails. How can we grow it? Can we grow it to 12? Can we grow it to 16? Et cetera, et cetera. And then I, it, it honestly, it felt on the precipice of having tw at least 12, if not 16 teams, and then COVID hit and just shut that down for another couple of years. Uh, so I was really, really happy because it, Felt like I had laid a little bit of the groundwork and been a part of that to help get it up to that point. Uh, so when the NCAA did it, it was it was the right move. We were down. We were literally the lowest sport of all NCAA sports in terms of the totality of teams and the percentage in the NCAAs. So moving it to 16 puts us you know, solidly in the middle now, at least. Uh, but although I think we'll we'll keep falling down because I think it's going to continue to grow, or at least that's my hope. Yeah. You know, I wanted to ask you, Todd, because um, I've been trying to find the exact, I guess, the the um, logistics of what that's going to look like. Is it going to be a play-in and then have the top four with a, a buy in the first two rounds? I mean, 
Um, there's not a whole lot of details out there. And I know that this has been a question that's been asked in, in a few circles. So I don't know if it's something you're at liberty to reveal or if there's a sense of what it could be. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot if you're going to be in trouble, but um, I guess what would the best format look like? <laughs> uh, I, I actually don't know. Uh, I have heard all the rumors as well. I'm no longer on the committee, so I haven't. Uh, I put some feelers out there as well, and most of my NCA feelers have been chopped off. Um, they just didn't <laughs> answer. Uh, so I. I don't know. The, the, the most common rumor that I heard that you probably have all heard is all 16 teams go to Gulf Shores. You get a single elimination on, let's say, Wednesday or Thursday, whatever day that ends up being. And then they do double elimination with the rest of the eight teams. Uh, what I have talked to some administrators about that, the area I think of concern and probably with the NCAA as well, is that this eight of the teams uh, you know, experience, their student athlete experience is going to be pretty Oh, we made it. Now we just get, you know, slapped on the head and told, see ya. Uh, there's no yeah. real experience there. So I'm not sure how they're going to get around that. Uh, I, I do think you can do a 16 team double elimination tournament. My, my hope is that they do that and they just add more courts and maybe two duels are going on at the same time. I mean, Madison, Rob, you guys have been there. That beach is huge. You can put 50 courts on there. So why not put 20 courts and have a lot of practice courts and, then have two duels going on, or maybe they're slightly offset. So at the same time, there's a duel going on that finishes, everyone celebrates, but they're in the middle of another duel and we just keep going down that road. I, I've done the math on that. And that's, you could do that a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday tournament easily. You could even yeah. do a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, if you wanted, it would not be difficult. So I have my hopes, but I don't have any answers. We're hoping to get some answers soon, just because, you know, it's going to come quickly. It's three months yeah. and here we go. But you know, one thing that's going to be exciting is to have the ability to have fans back on the beach at Gulf Shores, because I feel like that was a missing element last year. And you can see the people lining the fence outside, which didn't make sense because they're all hanging there watching anyways. So um, final question for you guys. And um, you're going to come right out of the gates into probably the gauntlet of talent on the East Coast at the FSU Beach Bash. Um you're going to be facing number 12, FAU, number 20, North Florida, number three, Florida State, number four, TCU. It has to be one of the most excruciating weekends of competition right out of the bat. So um, with those powerhouses, they're competing. What are your thoughts on going up against the CCSA teams? Actually, the top CCSA teams. And we'll start with you, Tia. Um, I think I'm just really excited. We have a lot of um, new talent on our team um, that I think will – definitely get a crack at the lineup. Um, and even Todd was mentioning those few girls that have been on the team for a while, but I think have solidified their spots in, in the lineup this year. Um, I'm really excited for them to get to experience some of the top talent right out of the gate and kind of see what it feels like to go up against some of the top teams in the country. Um, I mean, there's no better way to see what it's like and and learn and and kind of start getting after it than being put up against the top talent in the country right away um so i'm really excited um i think you know everything's always up and down um especially longer tournaments like that so i'm excited to see how our team deals um with playing against some tougher competitors yep right you todd yeah, you know, Brooke and I, as we discussed earlier, have been friends for a long, long time, uh, training partners literally on the beach and whatnot. And uh, three or four years ago, she asked me, hey, would you be interested in coming out to FSU? I said, absolutely. But if we do, make sure we're playing the top teams. Um, I want to play as many top teams as I can. We're not going to be going out there two or three times. It's hard to get other than, you know, Florida State, LSU, and maybe TCU. It's hard to get them out on the West Coast. Uh, so it's kind of... The whole purpose of going there is to try and run the gauntlet of East Coast teams and see where we're at relative to them and 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 kind of go from there. Uh, so and our, you know, if we're if we're going to go that far, let, let's make sure that we're playing some some really good teams. That, that's my thought process, at least. Well, then it preps you for the next weekend, which is Stanford, Long Beach State, Grand Canyon, UCLA. So. <laughs> yep. Uh, so, yeah, our first two weekends are not easy. Um, but again, as we were talking about, I, I just think that start it off hard and difficult and see where you kind of are at and then try and make an adjustments moving forward, knowing full well, we're going to see all those teams uh, at the end of the season. So we, we better be prepared and might as well start at an early 
early point rather than three quarters of the way through and then try and scramble uh, to make adjustments when it might not be enough time to make adjustments. Right. Well, it's all been good stuff. And we are all excited that within a few days, all of you are going to be on your sand courts going at it and competing. So exciting Ooh. week in February. Um, Todd Rogers, head coach of Cal Poly, Tia Mirich of Cal Poly. Thanks for coming on to College Volleyball Weekly Beach Edition Top 20 preseason. Um, looking forward to seeing it in person. Actually, I'll be seeing it at UCLA, I believe, in, in Los Angeles. So um, be seeing you guys uh, get some good action on the courts. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Madison. Thank you guys, thanks, thanks a lot. Guys.